I can't see that clock. But uh, I can preach fast if you can listen fast. If you have your Bible, turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 15. Beginning in verse 11. He said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together Most likely his assets that his father gave him was property and livestock. So probably gathered all together means he turned it into hard cash. Gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a famine in that land, a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would vain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father and he was yet a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto his father, said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. <clears throat> For this my son was dead and is alive again. <coughs> he was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. I want to speak to you tonight <coughs> about the prodigal son. Is this the Baptist real? Can I? You know, when you think of a prodigal, normally you think of someone that is uh, <clears throat> on drugs involved in alcohol. Among other things. And although that may be true, I 
But on the other hand, I believe that sometimes a prodigal may be someone who has been very successful in life and actually can be respected by other people. <clears throat> many have achieved much and are admired by many people. So let's look tonight and see what a prodigal is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for the honor and the privilege to preach the word of God. Now I pray that you will bless us tonight, bless this message, and we ask your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, a lot of people, many times, I believe that a prodigal is somebody who basically wants to live as he pleases. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by that. This prodigal was that way. He said, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Now, according to Deuteronomy 21, 17, the oldest son of the two sons here was entitled to a double portion of the father's estate. <clears throat> here, the younger son would have received one third but he was under a moral obligation to use the inheritance in a way that is pleasing to the father. <coughs> but he ignored that. And you know, God has given us a lot of things, especially here in this country. But I believe that we are under an obligation to use things that he gives us in a way that is pleasing to him. Just like this young man here. <coughs> this young man decided he could take his resources that he got from the father, go his own way and live a better life. And a lot of us are the same way toward our Heavenly Father. This young man wanted independence. You see, to remain at home meant to be subject to the will of the Father. And he just did not want that. He wanted the inheritance, but he didn't want to be subject to the will of the Father. To every person, God gives us certain abilities, opportunities, and material possessions. But God wants us and would like for us to use what we have for Him and for His glory according to His will. You know, why do people leave God out of their lives? God has given us everything, everything we possess, everything we have, this church, the pastor of this church, everything come from God. So the reason many people leave God out of their life is not because they don't believe in him, is not because they hate God, because they feel like they just don't need God. They feel like they don't need Him. They feel like they can do without Him. They just want to be on their own. This young man wanted his independence. He didn't want his father telling him what to do or telling him how to spend his inheritance. And so the Bible says he left 
and went into the far country. Now the far country can be Pensacola or it can be Chicago, but it, this young man, it said he went into the far country and then <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 14, who will spend all went into the far country and lived a riotous life and then the Bible says he spent all. And then it says he began to be in want. A Jew would have been degraded by feeding swine. Also, there's a possibility that the owner would have been a Gentile. Since both keeping and feeding swine was forbidden for Jews. But it may not have been a Jew since he was in the far country. And this young man began to want for the bare necessities of life. You see, he had spent everything. He was living in the hog pen. He didn't want a new house or a new car. I want to tell you tonight that sin will stomp you. It will put you in the dirt and then it will put its foot on your neck. And that's what it did to this young man. So this young man began to want the bare necessities of life, uh, food to eat, a place to live, clothes to wear. He began to want for material things, what we would call necessities because he had been brought into the dirt, he had been brought to the bottom. You know, many times, no person really seeks God as long as they feel self-sufficient. That's why many times God has to bring us down. Sometimes it may be mean, mean going into the hospital or tragedy in our life a financial loss. But this young man had spent it all. Everything was gone. He was wearing rags. He smelled like a pig. Everything was gone. But this young man spent more than his possessions. He spent his conscience and received guilt. You know, a lot of times the devil will entice us to do something. The devil may not bother you, but he does me, boy, I tell you. He'll entice us to do something. And then when we do it, he'll stand back and say, look what you did. You call yourself a child of God. You call yourself a Christian. And look at you getting angry. Look at you speaking to your wife or your husband that way. He received guilt. Also, he spent his freedom. A lot of times when a young person is 15 or 16 years old, 13 or 14 maybe, young person They have the idea, as soon as I get 16, buddy, I'm out of here. 
Yeah, I can take care of myself. Yes, sir. This young man, he spent his freedom. What he thought was freedom turned into bondage. And you may think it's freedom to get out from under the Father, but that freedom can turn into bondage. The best thing that happened to this son was in verse 17. And where the Bible says, I perish with hunger. What he thought would be freedom turned out to be bondage. Man is created with an instinctive, an instinctive desire or hunger for God. And men don't know what that is. And they think that just anything will satisfy that hunger. That's the reason that many people take drugs, get involved in alcohol. They do not want to submit to the God of heaven like this young man did not want to submit to his father. Just anything cannot satisfy that hunger. I remember a preacher friend I had a long time ago. Well, I guess he's still my friend. I don't know where he is. His mother, he lived in Memphis. She could not find anything to satisfy her desire, so she jumped into the Mississippi River. People don't understand that what they need is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can satisfy. I have taken this, squeezed this world like a man would squeeze an orange for some satisfying juice. There's nothing here. Nothing. Nothing here to satisfy the long of the man's soul. David said, I'll never be satisfied until I awake on the other side in his light. Then the Bible says, and when he came to himself, came to himself may well be a Semitic term for repentance. I don't know. But having claimed his birthright, this son had no more claim to his father's estate. He knew his offense and was willing to abide by the implications. What he had done. This may be a mark of genuine repentance. Verse 18. Self. He came to himself. From self comes the word selfishness. Second Timothy 3 and verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Philippians 2.21, for men seek their own, not the things that are Jesus Christ. In Proverbs 14.12, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. From self comes the word self-righteousness. 
Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 30 and verse 12, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. From self comes the word self-deception. Jeremiah 9, 6, thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. He said, I will arise and go to my father. Verse 18 again. And he did, he came to his father. In this situation, most people today will say, I'll do better. I'll become more active in church. I'll recite a prayer. I'll turn over a new leaf. You find the leaf is just as dirty on the other side. I'll be more active in church. Now those things are good, but they're not good enough. Blessed is the person who has settled for nothing less than going to the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now if you notice here in this story, the father did not go after his son while he was in the far country. And the father did not deny the fact that he had a right to his inheritance. And he did not attempt to hold the boy at home. Now I believe there, there's a reason. Our relationship with God is based on love and love cannot be compelled. In other words, you can't make someone love you. A young man might see a young lady and think that she's got a pretty face and he'll go up to her and say, you know, you sure are beautiful and I love you and he'll get her in a headlock and drag her down the road and try to make her marry him. Now, I don't think that'll last very long but you can't make someone love you. For God to bring us by force would destroy the relationship that he wants. And I think here this boy also was not a Baptist. Why? Because of what he said in, the, in verse 18, he said, Father, I have sinned. Most independent Baptists don't sin. At least they think they don't. I've sinned against heaven and before thee. You see, this, he did not even try to excuse himself. He did not blame all of his life's problems on everybody else. <coughs> then in verse 19, <clears throat> the young man, he came back to the father and he said, make me the chairman of the deacons. So for sure he wasn't a Baptist. I don't really care what you make me, just make me a boss. 
I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to tell folks what to do. No, he said, make me as one of thy hired servants. <clears throat> this boy had reached the bottom. No prodigal ever finds God until he is willing to yield completely. Now, he may say he has. In the Bible, they call those folks stiff necks. Now, I know we don't have any in here, but I'll tell you about them so in case one shows up, you can identify. I like you, <laughs> but let's, what is the attitude of the father? When this young man came back, he fell on his neck and kissed him, for one thing. And uh, I knew a missionary that had a story book, a Bible story book, and they was, the mother was reading it to the children. And in the story book, it said the young man, when he came back home and his father fell on his neck and kissed him. He lifted up his voice and cried. Now, the Bible doesn't say he cried. But the mother asked her five-year-old boy, I said, why? Why do you think that little boy cried? He said, because his daddy fell on his neck. And that's probably a good reason. But let's look at the now you know why I don't tell jokes when I preach. <laughs> what is the attitude of the father? When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had contempt, went in the house, slammed the door, and wouldn't let the boy in. When he came home, the father lectured him and publicly humiliated him, humiliated him and put him on probation and said, boy, you do that again and you're out of here. Mm. You say, well, that, that's not what it says, then why don't we do that? You, and I don't, Brother David, he don't do that. But you'd be surprised the preachers that do that. They tell them they're going to, I'll tell you what we got to do. We got to watch you. <laughs> Wonder what that means to be watched. That's what they say. We got to watch you. Father had not yet heard his son's confession. But his desire was to dis restore his lost son in verse 20. Amen. I believe that the son, the son rehearsed everything he is going to say on his way home. And I believe that it was unexpected what his father did. The son did not expect that. For his father to fall on his neck and kiss him and forgive him.
the Father's graciousness and love presented an entirely different result from what the Son had envisioned. And I want to tell you tonight, our Heavenly Father is the same way. I don't care what you've done in the past. It's in the past. Our God is a God of mercy, a God of forgiveness, and a God of love. And he will forgive you. The Bible says, he said, bring the best robe and put it on him. You know, the word of God says that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And I believe they brought that robe over there to that boy, put it over his head and brought it down on his body. And you could not see the, the dirt and the filth and the grime from the pig pen. Because he had that robe on him and the Bible says we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You see all of these things that the Father did, our Heavenly Father does the same thing. When he had the robe on, you could not see the dirt from the far country. Then he said, put a ring on his hand. The ring sig signified membership in the family and put shoes on his feet. A prodigal son, the son must have shoes. In those days, the slaves went bare feet, but sons had shoes. So he said, put shoes on his feet. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, let me tell you something before I close. A prodigal is not always someone who wants to do wrong. Not always. Now let me tell you something. <clears throat> A young lady 14, 15, 16 years old. She don't get in her mind when she's that age. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave my mama and my daddy. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to get involved in drugs. And I'm going to become pregnant. Out of wedlock. They, they don't. The young lady don't think that in her mind. But it happens sometimes. So a prodigal is not always someone who wants to do wrong. A young man doesn't say, I'm going to go out, get on drugs, shoot somebody, and go to prison. It's not always the case. And sometimes we're not as forgiving as we should be. You know what a prodigal is? is someone who feels self-sufficient with their own resources. Someone who doesn't need Christ 
because they have religion. Someone who can take their resources, forget about God and live their own life and do what they want to do because they're independent. So I asked you tonight, are you a prodigal? A prodigal can be someone who is a member of a church and attends church on a regular basis. So are you a prodigal? Let's stand. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight 